Welcome everyone to the January 2023 chapter meeting of the Hearing Loss Association of America North Bay Chapter. My name is Sarah Ozer. I'm the president and here today is Tana Cooley, vice president. And um, coming into the meeting right now is Sarah Rose, treasurer, and Jim Ozer is our tech host. Whether you're from our area, Marin and Sonoma counties, north of San Francisco, or whether you join us from another place, we welcome you today. For the past five years, North Bay has been accomplishing our mission of improving the world of communication for people with hearing loss through information, education, support, and advocacy. Let me elaborate how we actually accomplish that mission. The first item is information. We have chapter meetings on the second Thursday of the month in Zoom, like today, with speakers who provide information about products and share their experiences in the world of hearing loss. We have brochures like these in back of me with printed information about hearing loss, purchasing a hearing aid and understanding hearing loop technology. Our second mission item is education. We provide education through outreach tables like the ones we did this past year. We were at the Santa Rosa Senior Center, Spring Lake Village, and the Rotary International event at Turo University. And we also educate through our responses to email. And each of us here educates others in our daily lives about hearing loss in our own ways. We also hire a remote captioner, that's Kelly, to provide accurate captions. These are our ramps for these monthly meetings so that everyone can understand. We call this captioning CART, Communication Access Real-Time Translation. It's important for all of us to understand the importance of having captioning when we attend events, whether in person or virtually, and to request them so that those of us with hearing loss can participate fully. We also put our meetings on the HLAA California YouTube channel for everyone in the world to view. Our third mission item is support. We provide support through our fourth Thursday, Hearing Other People's Experiences, Hope, Support Group where we listen to each other intently and offer tips and suggestions from our own experiences of living with hearing loss. We distribute our postcards in back of me here to hearing health professionals so that they can provide them to their clients. And the last mission item is advocacy. We advocate for people with hearing loss by writing letters to our representatives, requesting captioning on public television, by requesting hearing accessibility in venues like auditoriums, places of worship, theaters, and by encouraging others to acknowledge our hearing loss. We walked at Crown State Beach in Alameda last summer along with others from this area to create awareness about hearing loss. If you are able to join us at our leader, leaders meeting next Thursday, January 19th, we would welcome your input on how we can continue to expand our outreach. Perhaps you know someone who would like to speak to our group or perhaps there is a project you would like to spearhead. We are here to make that happen. And a reminder that our fourth Thursday Hope Support Group is um, 
on January 26th. So today we welcome Camila Ryder, a Los Angeles based writer who has become a hearing loss advocate. Cami shares her story, her experience of helping her grandmother. Please put your questions in the chat while Cami is speaking. And Cami will answer them either during the presentation or right after in the Q&A and discussion part. Thank you for being here, Cami. Uh, we welcome you. Thank you so much for having me. Uh, thank you, Sarah, and thank you everyone who is here this afternoon. Um, and I'm excited to um, share my story with HLAA. And um, just a little bit about myself. Um, my name's Camila Ryder, but I also go by Cami. Either works for me. Um, I'm from the Los Angeles area. I grew up here. Um, and I've been assisting my mom and in, in caregiving for my grandparents for the past 10 years, and then specifically for my grandma for the past six to seven years. Um, she's been living in a retirement home, um, and it's a very nice facility. And then uh, right before COVID hit, we had moved her into a, an ass the assisted living, um, but she has had hearing loss for about maybe over 10 to 15 years. And it was something that, you know, when she and my grandpa were still independent, um, they were handling on their own and had gone to, um, I think something like hearing connect one of those um places where you you just go and you can just buy a hearing aid um but we had never really been part of the uh, my mom and I had not been part of those doctor's visits my mom did every other doctor's visit imaginable um but we hadn't been part of those um she had had a variety of hearing aids um, over these past 15 years. And then as her hearing loss um, became more significant, the hearing aids just weren't working as well. And it was a real struggle for, um, for her, I think, to be heard. Um, and also when she would attend, um, you know, she liked to go to lunch at the retirement home where she's at. Um, and she struggled with uh, how loud it could be, but like just in the room, but also how much she couldn't even, she struggled to hear the people who she was sitting at the table with. And so we started going to see if there were, you know, better hearing aids for her. Um, we, you know, I'm, I think she spent a boatload of money on some hearing aids, but they still aren't the best for her. Um, but about three years ago, I met um, Sarah's son, Carl, and, um, through him, Sarah and I were talking about, um, my grandma and, and hearing loss and, and how to help her. Um, and, you know, we had been really struggling with trying to get, um, something to help her when she was talking to family on the phone, um, because everyone complained that she couldn't hear them. And she said, you know, she couldn't understand, um, anyone on the phone or when she would go out to eat. So that was just a real struggle because, um, yeah, she just felt like she was um, not able to hold a conversation because other people would get frustrated with her. Um, but this past um, December, actually, sorry, um, over the summer, uh, Sarah was very kind and gifted um, for my grandma the comfort audio duet um, device. Um, it was something that uh, Sarah and I had used together going on like walks and things like that. And um, she had recommended that this would really help my grandma to hear a bit better, um, particularly for one-on-one -on -one or kind of quieter settings. Um, 
And in December, uh, my grandma got COVID at the assisted living center that she's at. And then um, because of that, she fell and broke her hip. And so she had to go to the hospital. And because she had COVID, we weren't allowed to go with her to the hospital. Um, and I think in, you know, in the, as anyone knows, when you get admitted to the ER or have to be taken in an ambulance, it's always just so crazy. I don't think she either had her hearing aids in or like she didn't have the little comfort duet um, thing either. And so when she was there, she was still, you know, very verbal and talking, but then, um, and we would talk to her on the phone and just yell as loudly as we could um, to let her know that we were there and thinking of her. Um, but then because she had hip surgery and anesthesia, um, we think it's probably a blend of her being 89 years old and having COVID and that anesthesia can really, um, for people who are in their 80s or 90s, anesthesia can, people have a hard time getting out of it who are that age. Um, and so, you know, we got calls from the hospital saying, you know, does she talk? Does she speak? She doesn't respond to us. And they started telling, dismissing and saying that she had dementia or Alzheimer's um and that you know something was wrong with her um and we were really freaked out so when we um were finally able to see her after the surgery once she was out of the COVID quarantine um I brought the comfort duet hearing device um and I put it on her um and you know, I just started talking into it and her eyes like opened and she like, as much as she was very out of it, we could tell there was recognition that she was hearing us. Um, and we knew that, you know, she didn't have Alzheimer's or dementia the way they were telling us she did, but we were so freaked out by seeing her in such a, you know, very, uh, she was very out of it because she was uh, still recovering from the anesthesia. Um, but immediately we tried to start telling the doctors and the nurses and whoever was there that she has this hearing device, she can hear and she's responsive, but you need to always have it on we, I put together all these instructions on how to charge it, how to turn it on, how to attach it to her, where to speak into it. Um, and it can be hard, you know, a hospital, it, they change shifts all the time. So it was having to like teach uh, people over and over again. Um, but the thing that we were really um, frustrated by was just that there was this dismissal of her unresponsiveness um, as being dementia and that her inability to hear them, they didn't even consider that, you know, that that was an, an issue. Um, and the other thing that we were also uh, frustrated by is um, we are Latino. My grandma is from Central America, um, but she speaks English and Spanish both fluently and we think it was also part of, um, you know, a discrimination where they thought she only spoke Spanish. And so they refused to really communicate her, with her in general. So it was just, she went a, a good period of time, um, particularly when we couldn't see her because she was still testing positive for COVID. Um, we think that people just weren't communicating with her. People weren't saying who they were when they walked into a room because they just figured she um, doesn't know anything um, or they talked to her in a way that was just, it was just very, um, it just felt like very rude when we would see people walk in um, and just totally ignore her. Um, but when we were there and when I would show the nurses or the doctors that came in, 
what the device was, how to use it. Um, first off, they were really intrigued because they had never seen it before. And they thought it was great. And one nurse said, I wish all of our patients who come in, you know, who have hearing loss could have something like this or that the hospital had access to it because it helped them communicate with her so much better to say who they are, what they were going to do, what they needed her to do. Um, and we were just very adamant. We started to put big signs that said sh she has hearing loss, use this device. She speaks English and Spanish. Um, and then the instructions that I had put together, we put them all kind of there in the hospital and tried our best every time to communicate to to whoever that this was how they could communicate with her. Um, and also it gave me an opportunity when she was a little still out of it to play music very quietly into the microphone um, and just kind of see if that would help her, you know, wherever she was in, in her brain, help her kind of come back to um, then a normal state for her. Um, and so finally, like she's, um, doing so much better. She's out of that anesthesia haze. Uh, she's in a skilled nursing facility now. Um, and I brought my instructions. I brought my signs and uh, we've been telling everyone um, who comes in. And so there's so many different people. There's CNAs, there's RNs, LVNs, there's doctors, all these different people come in. Um, and they'll just sort of start like yelling at her, you know, because <laughs> instead of just like we, and so a lot of times we have to be like, she can hear, you need to use this device or she has her hearing aids. We try to make it part of the routine um, for when they're getting her dressed in the morning to make sure they put this, uh, her either the comfort duet or her hearing aids on so that people can communicate with her and that she doesn't feel so confused because something that she has told me a lot is that people come in and I think it's a blend of either just thinking she has dementia or not really acknowledging how that there is a device there to help with the hearing loss um, and they don't introduce themselves or what they're going to be doing and it's a very it, you know, uncomfortable process to to have someone just walk in and start poking and prodding or asking, you know, trying to tell you to do things of, you know, not telling you that they're going to take blood from you or things like that, because they just think she can't hear or she has dementia. So that's been really um, a, just a big battle for us of trying to make sure everyone we interact with there, when we're there, we tend to be there about seven to eight hours a day if we can, um, which is kind of hard right now, but we're trying to do it um, and just making sure um, people know how to interact with her. And some people are so much better than others because they've able, I think they've probably worked with patients who have hearing loss and they, you know, we, we show them the device and they're like, oh, this is great. And they'll clip it on her or they'll hold it themselves. And they see that she responds so much better. Um, and sometimes people forget and then they remember like, oh, if she's not responding, it's because she's not hearing you and to keep trying um, and not ignore her. And that's definitely been something that um, we have just felt, my parents and I are just so important to us now that um, we see so many people like my grandma who are dismissed in a hospital setting or a, a nursing facility um, or even out and about in the world because people say something to them and because they can't hear, they're not gonna respond. And I think that it's something that I would hope so many more people could have access to devices like the one Sarah gave to my grandma. Um, honestly, it's just, it's helped us so much. I've been able to have really meaningful conversations with her 
um, over the past few weeks of just because I can attach it to my shirt or my jacket and we can just sit there, the two of us, and and have really good conversations. And she feels really empowered when she can hear you because then she knows how to respond and how to ask for what she wants. And that's something that we're just so grateful for. And it's really just helped her a lot. And I want to share a couple of pictures really quickly of just um, her with the device and how we've been using it. So Sarah, do you mind um, providing me with this screen share function? And I know I've been talking a lot, so <laughs> um, I'm happy if, if you have any questions or, um, you know, if there was something more specific uh, that any of you were... So, Cami, at the bottom of your screen, it should, mm -hmm. there should be an option to show screen, and you it's, should be able to do that. Sure. It says host disabled participant screen sharing. Uh, okay, try it now. So, just click the big arrow where it says share screen. You should be able to do it. Sure. Okay. Okay, one second. Um, for some reason, hmm. Sarah, can oh, you here we go. Okay, I got it. Sorry. <laughs> That's okay. Can and everyone? Can you see this? Okay, great. Okay, um, so really briefly, this is her um, using the comfort duet with the physical therapist. And it's been really great because obviously everyone's fully masked um, and this helps so much um, and being able for, for her to understand because she can't lip read. Um, and so this has been really helpful. Um, let me see if there's one more. This is just her, or uh, we'll attach the um, device to her pillow or different things. And you can just see, this is kind of the facility where she's at. Um, she gets to wear regular clothes now before she was in a, a hospital gown, but now she gets to have regular clothes and today we I yesterday I painted her nails and today we you know did her hair and everything so we wanted her to feel good about herself um, and then this is just a picture of where she used to live and an assisted living um, and this was how we were able to talk um, you know just for with uh, distance so she could continue eating and I could talk with her with for COVID safety and then she used it uh, while she was talking on her cell phone um, and it really did help um, it really did help her to um, be able to hear uh, my uncles and and whoever else was calling her uh, much better um, and we we try to communicate with our family that you need to speak slowly and clearly with her. Um, that doesn't mean you can't have a you know regular conversation, but we really emphasize uh, clarity and just kind of slowing it down uh, because everyone in our family has a different, uh, people talk way too quickly or things like that. And, and that is hard for her, but um, we've been just really, really uh, happy to see that she's doing so much better, was able to really get out of this anesthesia haze and that she's able to do a lot more um, like building of her strength, but also with the ability to communicate with everyone around her um, in a way that I think there's, it's another aspect of making sure she has her dignity and is comfortable and 
has a little bit of her independence that she enjoyed before having surgery. And I think that the hearing device is definitely part of that. So I'm eternally grateful to Sarah for, for giving uh, us this chance to have something like this. And I, I would really hope there was a, a way for some of these hospitals or other facilities to have some sort of similar devices. Um, and again, I think it's just so important to have um, at least a sign on you or someone who can bring things to advocate for you to the hospital. Um, everyone needs an advocate and I know it can be really hard um, to have an advocate, especially during COVID, but um, we just have seen how important that is for her health overall, um, but also to make sure we're there to tell people that you can talk to her and she can hear you. You just need to do these extra little steps um, to make sure you're respecting her and communicating with her. So we really hope that, um, yeah, there are ways to, to kind of, I know HLLA and a bunch of other organizations do so much advocacy work. And um, I really feel very inspired now to, to do more around this area. So um, I'm curious about if anyone's run into some of, you know, similar things in hospital settings or with doctors or anything like that. Um, so if you've had that experience, I'd, I'd love to know about it or, you know, ways that you think might be helpful. So thank you so much, Cammie, for sharing um, that story. There's so many issues you brought up. Um, so I'd like to open the floor to questions and um, for Cami and discussion. Uh, Anne, please go ahead. Unmute. Oh, I think you're muted. I am so profoundly moved by your story and so angry, I cannot see straight. <laughs> Do you know that the hospital and the assisted living facility are responsible to provide you with effective communication under the law and they have all violated your grandmother's civil rights? I did not know about that. I mean, it's, it, enraged me and, and my parents so much and it felt like I mean we've been really angry and have communicated to the hospital about you know certain experiences with doctors and because my grandma has an HMO there was definitely a another form of uh discrimination that was going on um and how they don't want to treat people who have HMOs but um I think that there just was no um, support from anyone in the hospital, except for some nurses who did their very best to try and communicate with her and with us. But um, no, I mean, there was no, no one like representative of the hospital that, um, offered any sort of like support about this so it's okay, been so the department yeah. of justice recognized um the lack of communication ask access at hospitals in around 2011 hmm. and they started the health care initiative and hmm. they are settling lawsuit after lawsuit after lawsuit with hospitals for similar situations to hmm. yours now you're not required to bring your granny's device. They're required to provide you with one. Hmm. Okay, so are you and your family at all interested in taking any kind of legal action or filing complaints against these entities? <laughs> I don't, at this point, I don't know. I mean, we've, we were extremely angry about, about the hearing, um, 
you know, their dismissal of her hearing loss, but also just a bunch of other mistreatment that went on. Um, at this point, we've been so consumed with just, you know, making sure we're there every day because she has now tons of physical therapy and all this other stuff. And we're, you know, doing a, a lot there that I'm not sure at this point, but it's something that I know my parents have been very angry about. And I just don't know if that's something that they would consider, but perhaps maybe. Yeah. Okay, so please keep me in mind. I would be happy to direct sure. you to where you may be able to get what you need, either with a disability attorney or, yeah. and I want to let you know that there is a technology that's available that I think might be more beneficial to your grandmother with her physical therapy. Mm. And the reason is it's two components. Mm. So your grandmother would have a receiver, mm -hmm. which is similar to her comfort duet, mm -hmm. but the other person has a transmitter. So mm. they don't have to be in this distance like this to her talking into that. The mm -hmm. physical therapist could be back here giving her directions and she would hear it like mm -hmm. she's hearing it through the comfort duet. Okay. That would be, yeah. Anything. I think we're, we're willing to try so many different things so that. No, no you need yeah. to ask them. Oh, we have to ask. To make them. Ah, okay. You need to say, my grandmother needs this, and this is what would work so that okay. the, the physical therapist can have some distance from her. Mm -hmm. um, there's so many tech, there's so many technologies they could have used. Can she read English? Oh, yes. English okay. and Spanish. They yeah. could have done a speech to text app. They could have used it on an iPhone, on mm -hmm. an Android phone, on an iPad, which is better because they can be bigger. Right. And every single thing that they said would have been transcribed on the screen and she could have read it. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's really outrageous. Your story is so outrageous. Yeah, it's outrageous. And I think we. What we were realizing is, I mean we're so involved in her life and we felt like, okay, of course we're going to be there. And even if we couldn't be there because of COVID, you know, my mom was annoying the hell out of every nurse and like whoever would answer a phone. Um, but we just thought of all the people who don't have that can't either communicate, you know, that this is what they need or, no one's giving them it, the option in a different language. Like, I just think that it was, it, it was just, it was, too. Yeah. it was, it was outrageous. And we've been, we've struggled with the, the hospital before and just, you know, but they were recently acquired by USC University of Southern California, which has quite a boatload of money. <laughs> um, and we're, we're curious about, you know, whether they would invest in anything like that. But I think most people don't until there's legal action. Okay. No, uh, it's not about whether they want to, they have to. They have to. And yeah. so I'm wondering if one of the hard places is figuring out how to connect to the right person right. to talk to. And I'm assuming in this meeting, we're not going to really bash all these people in public I would be more than happy to talk to you about that. Definitely. USC has a disability ADA coordinator for the school. Mm -hmm. They have to have it for the hospital. It's a big deal here. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and I really understand when your family member is ill, it's like impossible to take care of these things because you're so involved with them. Right. Right. And I mean, I've had sick family members. I really know that. Mm -hmm. um, I would be willing to devote a little bit of attention to directing you to some things, doing some research for you if you wanted to do that. Um, and if your family doesn't do it, other families are going to have the same thing. That's oh, the yeah. best place. Yeah. 
So well, I, I would said, appreciate that. And I can give you my contact information and, or if you would share it with yours with me and I'll reach out. Cause I think we've just been s- slowly kind of thinking about some of this stuff. And I think that it might, particularly because we just felt like there's going to be hundreds, about thousands of more people who are going to have, I'm sure gone through this and will continue to go through this. And it's just, it's so unfair. And I think it's, it's also unfair that there's just this, you know, we were just like, not only is there age discrimination, there's discrimination against hearing loss against, um, her identity and uh, her language. And there was just so much going on that it was just, I mean, we were, (laughs) we were so enraged, but it was just, it can be hard to figure out, yeah, who to talk to. So I think that's, uh, would be really helpful. So Camilla, in many, many, many hospitals, they do have more language interpreting than Mm -hmm. they do for hearing loss. And so in Mm -hmm. your, in your, um, grandmother situation um i know that ucsf has video interpreting that's available Mm. all the time via ipads yeah and so i'm wondering if the hospital didn't have that and nobody you didn't didn't get to the right person and so this is part of a conversation for all of us because I've changed the language I use about hearing loss. I say that we all live uncertain lives because we never know when we're going to be able to hear and when we're not. And so if you get rushed to the hospital for something, the chances that everybody's going to leave their devices at home is great. Yeah. If there's another emergency. And so even though you may be able to take care of yourself when you're relatively healthy, or you maybe have a mate who comes who's really not required to be there, and it's sort of a violation of the law that they ask your family members to interpret for you. Um, when the situation happens, when they can't be there, then nothing is in place and nothing's been taken care of to see that that yeah. you could handle yourself, right? Right, right. Yeah. Outrageous story. Absolutely outrageous. Thank, thank you. I, I appreciate you your support and, and your anger about this because I, I think, you know, this was just something we experienced. And I think that it's just the, the ways in which I I know there's so many, um, so many people who, who, who know this anger already. And I think that that's, um, that's something that we're just, we're just kind of coming into. And so I'm, I'm appreciate your support and, and all of that. So, yeah. And I think also having the knowledge that there were rights that were violated. So I think that's, that's a knowledge that um, most people just, you don't know. And then we didn't really, we didn't know in in terms of, of that. And so I'm, I'm grateful to know this. Um, I'm so mad. I'm surprised you can't see it through the screen. (laughs) Um, Cammy, I saw a presentation uh, some time ago Mm -hmm. from an, I guess I could look it up from a hospital back east and they they buy box loads of simple devices, simple hearing amplifiers, and they give them to people with appointments at the hospital. They yeah. give them, they give them, take them, take them home. Wow. Great. And that way they um, they are able to um, address the hearing loss, um, at least mm-hmm. at that level. So some hospitals are um, are more proactive, and mm-hmm. again, they they buy v- inexpensive um, devices, like uh, probably less expensive even than this device, mm-hmm. and just give them to everyone. Yeah, I'm I sorry. think that's. I mean, that's. That would be amazing. I, I'm, I think that's the thing is that we had no idea. And what's sad is that I think, I just think about all the other people who have even less access to any of this knowledge and, and just, it's sort of that feeling where, you know, and especially because our family is 
Latino, and I know there's such a um, deference and uh, respect for doctors and nurses and like kind of the medical field that you just sort of, that there's a feeling of like, they know everything and they're doing all the right things. And which, you know, it just is, and you don't, you don't ask as extra questions or you feel like you're being rude to ask for extra things, but it's just like, you don't even know that there's all these things that are in place that all these people have worked for to get, to get you to have that access. And they're not even providing it for you and seeing that if you don't know how to ask it for yourself, like someone, there needs to be people there who are, you know, they have so many protocols to follow. I understand, but this is another protocol that should be followed. Well, there actually are. The part that's really sad is that nobody connected you to any, and I don't know um, what, and you haven't mentioned the name of the um, hospital system before they were purchased by USC. Mm -hmm. It's um, a, um, it's called Arcadia Methodist Hospital. I'm not sure. I think they're just I don't know. That's been the name for many years. And I don't know if they were run by a, um, like a larger Methodist hospital group, um, or what, um, but the, the USC acquisition was very recent. Um, so I had no, I, I really don't know who they were run by before, but I will, I can obviously look that up. <laughs> mm -hmm. Okay, um, other, other, um, uh, Tana, yes, please. Hi, Cami. I really want to uh, applaud you both for sharing your story, but also for the amazing devotion your family had to your grandmother. And um, I know she probably doesn't feel lucky given everything that's happened to her, but she is lucky. <laughs> and I want to say that you know, be, uh, this was a bit triggering for me because a year and a half ago, I had a car accident and I ended up in a hospital where they were not providing any accommodations at all. And my son was also not allowed to come in and I was trying to use my cell phone app. And I had one doctor who refused to allow me to use the speak to tech app because he thought he was being recorded. And I wasn't really in any position to advocate for myself. I did complain about that particular doctor, but it was in a very, very large, I'm gonna say it, it was in Kaiser. And I'm really curious not to shift away from you, but Kaiser insures one out of five people in California. Sometimes I hear one out of four. And at some point, Anne, I would like to have a discussion with you, if you know anything that's being done with Kaiser. I have tried advocating with my providers for um, captions on the iPads that they bring around. And I keep hearing that they don't want anything in writing. It's always about the writing, you know? So your solution, Cami, with your mother was um, excellent because it got her the sound that she needed my preferred thing is captions, although when I first went to the hospital at the car accident, I really wasn't able to read the caption very well. Mm, yeah. So that, um, yeah. But I am just really glad to hear that your grandmother has so much support from your family. And if you are able to continue to follow up with Anne, I think that it would be a gift to the rest of us in some mm. ways. You know, I, although I totally understand when the family is so stressed with, you know, the need to provide support and, you know, the dual things that are actually triple things that are going on in discrimination here, a cheering loss and cultural language. Mm -hmm. um, if that's a lot of stress and to ask, this is where I wish I knew more about, there was some sort of company or advocacy that that's like sitting on hospitals and nursing homes and, and setting up protocols because it is really unfair to expect a patient or a family in crisis to do this yeah. so that's just my trigger I'm sorry I couldn't be more <laughs> but it's it's very devastating 
Yeah. yeah. Thank you for sharing that, Tana. And I'm I'm so sorry you went through yeah. that. And I think that it really is, I mean, what you were saying and 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 Anne mentioned this as well, is that you never know when you're gonna end up in the hospital and you never mm-hmm. know if you can be your advocate, even if you feel healthy enough or you feel like you can say the things that you need to say or what you need. And I mean, it's awful if someone denies the thing that you're asking that is the the one right. thing that might help or or whatever it might be. And I think that's what's just... Um, you know, there's, there's so much that we were, you know, when we were really stressed out, when we were at the yeah. hospital, we were looking up some things of like, okay, what are their policies? And can I, I just remember now that we had tried to see if there was an ombudsman or someone who was there. And, you know, you, we, you read their statement that's all very nice and pretty that says that, you know, they are going to, you know, be culturally sensitive. They're going to be all these different things. And you have so many doctors or nurses or whoever that they're just, they're going to respond in a way that's really disrespectful. And yeah, Yeah. I'm really sorry about that, that doctor. And I just think, yeah, I think talking to all of you today and, and hearing this, it's, um, I knew I wanted to talk today when, when Sarah asked, um, because it felt like my way of saying thank you for her providing this, this device to me. And I think something that I feel like you just said that another gift is to keep, keep pushing this forward and, and filing something with USC or, or the hospital or whoever it might be to say, like, what happened was horrible. And so many people go through this and it's, it's always going to, you know, Mm -hmm. we can't all, we, you know, like you, if you go into somewhere and you've, you've had an accident, that's what, what a burden to try and put on you, the patient, or, you know, your son couldn't be there. And I I just think it's, it's, it's such a vulnerable state that we end up being in, in a place like that. And you want all these things to, to be there so that you feel like someone's on your side and it's, yeah. So I think I feel very reinvigorated (laughs) in my desire to, to Mm -hmm. wreak some havoc on, you know, or at least have someone at least who is a representative from the hospital or something to listen, to listen to us. And and see if there's something we can do because yeah, I just, I don't want this to happen to anyone else. And so, yeah, thank you for sharing. Is this something, you know, would your grandmother feel good about you sharing this story with us? And can you tell her how much we appreciated it? I can tell her, like I talked with my parents about it and they were really excited and felt like, you know, they still have so much anger. I think my mom just felt like she was like, if I join that meeting, I'll just be crying the whole time. And I think she just felt like <laughs> she didn't want to do that. But um, yeah, I think for my grandma, you know, I think she's just, she's very tired right now. And is so focused on, yeah. you know, getting her surgery to, you know, she just got her staples out of her hip today. And, you know, she's starting to walk slowly with assistance. And I think her mind is so focused on that, but she has been very, I'm I'm happy to tell her because I think that positive reinforcement for her is Mm -hmm. good in general. And it's also been something we've been telling her every day because she's been really good at telling the people there now when they'll start talking to her, she'll like tap her ear and she'll like tap the device or whatever she's wearing and she'll like say like speak here and then they'll be like oh okay you know like you can't hear me and so then she's been really good at trying to do that now she did that before with us because she'd be like oh I can't hear you but now she's being very like deliberate of 
Yeah. You know, one of the things I was share with her about that is she learned that for herself, but she's also by that action educating every staff member who comes in yeah. that this is a way that you can help people. Yeah. And so in the future, you know, it's like planting a little seed and it will grow. Um, so I would thank her for that too, because it will help people besides her. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I'm, I'm excited to share this with her. And I think, yeah, she just, I think for her, you know, she's in such a focused state right now. And she has said, she knows how lucky she is that she has my mom, my dad and I, who are, are doing this for her and, and she sees how many people, especially in the facility that she's at, don't have people coming and, you know, to help or to, to share anything. And I think she's someone who has always been outspoken and is very assertive. Um, but I, I know for her just to keep sharing that, that this is important to keep doing that and that it is important, not just for her, but for others. I think that that's, that's something that will make her feel good. So, yeah. Um, Anne, you have your hand up. Yeah. Um, Camilla, I just want to make sure that you see the things that I've put into the chat and make sure to save them before we quit the meeting. Yes. I provided I, you with the telephone number, the name, everything for who to contact at, they're calling it now, um, USC Arcadia Hospital. Okay. And um, the statement and also USC itself. So I complained vehemently at UCSF in the past couple of years when um, I had to pull my teeth to get the accommodations I need and asked if they had a patient advocacy committee. And I'm mm. now the person representing hearing loss on that advocacy committee. Wow. Uh, wow. Good. And so I am seeing the inner workings of how possibly we might make this happen. But yeah. everybody really is aware now of the fact that there's this huge, huge, huge problem. Mm. Anna, I've done work with Kaiser. I'd really like to talk to you about that. There are numerous people who are really interested in finding some people who are willing to file lawsuit against them because they are completely ignoring everything. I talked to senior executives at Kaiser. Um, everything. Yeah. Yeah. Did you by any chance ask for CART? For CART? I did not ask for CART. I asked for captions and they said they didn't have them. Um, I mean, I was in the emergency room. I mean, I wasn't thinking real clearly. Well, I mean, um, later. I, do, I have asked for CART for um, appointments and that hasn't been provided. Um, I would like to talk with you more. Yeah, Anne, we'll do that. I, my, I've been taking care of my grandson and he's going to go to daycare two days a week now. So I have a little bit of time maybe opening up and the thing with Kaiser really makes me furious because it's such a big mega. They're, they're being thing. sued all over and losing. They lost in Southern California for hearing loss issues. Okay. So, well, I would love to have a conversation with you. Um, probably not right now because we're yeah. just starting my little grandson in daycare but maybe in a month or two it'd be great to follow up and find out what's going on and see if that's a place where what i can offer is valuable or not you know well so. the place that you if you don't even do anything is that you'd be willing to speak up see most people well, aren't, to speak aren't up, willing i mean to it's the one thing step. to speak up to individual providers in kaiser which is what i've done um, but that's different than, yeah, I know. And so I haven't taken it the next step. And that kind of like, and I don't really want to see them. I mean, what actually happened with me with the doctor who refused to let me use my, um, my Otter app was I complained to the social worker who came in. And I don't know if you know Kaiser, but you can always read the notes that I was, how I was getting along in the hospital was by reading the notes after they were filed on my Kaiser medical record. 
and he changed the notes after I made the complaint. So I don't see how I can get any verification now right. because he changed wow. the notes. You don't have to do that. That's what yeah. they're that's what lawyers are for. Oh, uh, um, okay. Anyway, um, yeah, I just feel like I've had this issue. I've been trying to work with individual providers in Kaiser. It hasn't worked. Um, if there's a way that I can be a voice, that's helpful. I don't really, I don't really want to sue them over this particular thing that happened at the Kaiser Hospital, but I would like to consider whether that's a place for me to put my time going forward. Okay, so I think um, Anne and Tana can meet, you know, uh, when it's right. when that works for you and take action on that. Um, Cami, I want you're a writer. I want to suggest to you that our organization oh, hey. has a magazine. You and I will, um, I can get you that information. It's on the website that you, I think it would be wonderful for you to, to write about your experience and you have those beautiful photos and um, include, you know, the topics that, um or especially you know irritating and your family's reaction and how you know whatever it is your next action mm -hmm. is i think it would be wonderful for you to write about it yeah i i appreciate that um yeah send me the information and um i'd be happy to i i feel more comfortable writing than speaking <laughs> but yeah. um but, uh, and Anne, I do have, I took a screenshot of the information in the chat and I have the links open now. Um, so I have that and, and um, yeah, I'd be happy to, I can put my, my information in the chat, my email address, and then um, perhaps I can get yours and I can be in contact with you. Okay. So, um, Anne, did you have something you want to say before we close? Oh, no, sorry. Okay. So, um, Cammie, we want to thank you so much for sharing your story and for making us aware of what's going on in hospitals and skilled nursing. Mm -hmm. What's going on with um, people who've who have COVID and uh, can't communicate or mm -hmm. are undergoing surgery. Uh, Jill, would you like to say something? I can't hear you. I, I was just reacting with the little symbols, clapping. Oh, <laughs> that's great. So can it we- was fabulous. Thank you, Jill. Um, thank you for being with us uh, today, Kimmy. And so it's um, it's five o'clock. I'd like to, to thank our captioner, Kelly DeCamp, for the beautiful captions, Kelly. And again, I want to make everyone aware of how important it is for us to just uh, take note of, of the captions and that these allow us to really understand thoroughly what's going on mm. and so we'll say goodbye to kelly and if you'd like to stay on to socialize fine um if not then we wish you a happy new year and hope to see you soon thank you everyone thank you sarah you're welcome so I'm going to stay on a while if anybody wants to chat. I'm going to leave. Thank you. I am. Thank you. Thank you, Cam. You know, I do hope you write something. I didn't know you were a writer. Oh. I would love to see that. <laughs> yeah, thank you, Tana. Thank you. Yeah. And thank you, Anne. Yeah, I hope, um, I hope everyone has a chance to tell their story. I think that's, that's okay. really important. So I'm, I'm happy that Sarah provided this platform and HLAA provided the platform. I think, okay. yeah, sometimes these things are, are hard to express depending on your experience and 
what you might still be going through. And, um, but yeah, I feel, you know, hearing your story and, and just hearing all the things about rights being violated, it's, uh, it's making me even angrier. <laughs> I think I had kind <laughs> of like, let things kind of calm down because I was like, oh, there's all the things I need to focus on with her care now. But I think it's, um, yeah, I think trying to share some of this information and, and see if there's a way to, to do something about it. So thank you for, for talking with me, Tana. I really appreciate that. I think it helped me see how much it, so many people go through this. So thank you. Yeah. All right. Well, thank you for coming, Cami. I think I'm going to leave the meeting. And Sarah, I will see you next week at the leaders meeting, right? That's right. Okay, so bye, Tana. Bye-bye. Oh, thank you, Sarah. I appreciate this. This was nice to do and nice to meet everyone. And everyone's very nice. Very you welcoming. You know what, Cami, you can, I'm going to, I put you on our mailing list. You're oh, welcome yeah. to come to our support group mm -hmm. or leaders meeting. Um, you don't have to have hearing loss, as you see. Yeah. Um, yeah. And we become friends. I mean, I, I know the people who were here today. Sometimes people appear, I don't know them, but they're all part of the HLAA world. And yeah. everybody has a different story. And yeah. um, I'm glad, uh, let's turn this off.